I'm predicting the biggest bust in world history is coming. So it's going to be the biggest opportunity of all times because, you know, Kim and I made our fortunes in 2008. Remember quantitative easing when it first came out? Ben Bernanke never said that it was QE1. He just said that it was QE because we weren't supposed to have a two, three, and now infinity. But what happens is the economy gets addicted to it. So now the economy is addicted to stimulus, government spending, and therefore addicted to this money printing, MMT, whatever you want to call it. So that's what the average investor needs to be cognizant of because they have to adjust their portfolio accordingly. If they don't, then they're really going to have some financial difficulties in the future. What that means is simply there's more currency units in the economy that are chasing goods and services. So there's more dollars. Fake money. It's fake news, fake money. The dollar is fake money because it's just an IOU. And to make it more extreme, all your checking account is, is the bank saying we owe you IOUs. <laughs> it's like a double IOU, <laughs> but they're creating more dollars. So it's just simple math. If there's more dollars out there chasing the same amount or fewer goods and services, most likely the price of those goods and services are going to increase. And if prices are going to increase over the next, call it 10, 15 years significantly, you need to have your portfolio set up in a much different way than if prices were to go down or stay the same over the next 10 to 15 years. The reason I call it fake money is the more the Fed prints money, the rich get richer. You know, we have asset inflation right now. We have asset inflation in the stock market, bond market, real estate market. It's really, it's feeding the rich. So UBI, MMT, quantity of reason, making the rich rich. Unfortunately, the middle class will pay higher taxes because the rich don't pay taxes. But what it does, when you have universal basic income and MMT, the poor get poor. You know, so if you're a poor person, you can't afford a house now because the real estate prices are so high. You know, and if you have universal basic income, I don't think a bank will touch you. You know, if you want to buy real estate. Yeah. It's like the, what was it in the Roman days, the bread and circus? It seems like it's the same thing today with the stimulus checks and the UBIs that people are getting a couple bucks in the mail and they're thinking that's fantastic. While at the same time, they're not realizing that they're being priced out of every single asset denominated in dollars. And if they do try to buy a house or if they do try to invest in stocks or bonds, and if they don't know what they're doing, they're going to get steamrolled because everything is in a bubble, thanks to the Fed, the money printing, the artificially low interest rates. And UBI will accelerate that. That's right. It'll make the bubble so big, it turns into a mania. You know what's interesting too, you use the word mania, and we hear a lot in the media right now with this cancel culture, where everyone is hysterical about everything else, but there's also a lot of hysteria in the stock market, in all these asset classes. So it's like we live in this world where everyone is hysterical about something. It's just kind of pick your poison. There's capital gains and there's cash flow. And you got to know what you're going for. So in real estate or in stocks or in bonds, people most of the time are going for capital gains. So when a person flips a house, they're going to buy it for 100, goes to 200, they're going to net 100. But the trouble with capital gains is you pay tax on it. But the other part, there's always a boom and a bust. And I'm predicting the biggest bust in world history is coming. So it's going to be the biggest opportunity of all times because, you know, Kim and I made our fortunes in 2008 because, you know, we had apartment houses and our tenants were leaving to buy their houses they couldn't afford. I mean, there was a thing called a ninja loan, no income, no job. Okay, so there's booms, busts, capital gains, cash flow. And there's a thing called, you know, and there's always the opposite. I was at the gym just now and before everybody came out, I said, I felt for this guy. He says, I've been a bus driver for 40 years. I'm going to retire and I can't wait. You know, he's turned 65. I said, what do you got? He said, I got a 401k. I said, what's it filled with? He says, oh, I just sold all my stocks at the top of the market. And I went into bonds. George, what did he just do? 
the most stupid thing he could possibly have done. First of all, you should never put all your eggs in one basket, but especially not the bond market right now with the, all the money printing that you referred to earlier. You know, Robert, before you said you think the market is going to crash. So whether that's the stock market, real estate market, um, the question is, does it crash in nominal terms or adjusted for inflation? See, the stock market can stay the same as it is right now, but if we get 10% inflation because of all the money printing, you'll actually lose purchasing power, you see? So the market can crash up just as easy as it can crash down if your definition of a crash is losing purchasing power. So if you're someone that believes like I do, that once the Fed starts printing all this money, the government prints all this money with stimulus and whatnot, they cannot stop. It's right. like a heroin addict. The only thing they can do is print more and more right. and more. And if they can't reverse course, then you need to start thinking through your portfolio in terms of hard assets. Correct. Something tangible. Well, I'm an entrepreneur, but if the crash wipes out your business, you have no cash flow. And what happened when um, a COVID hit for Kim and myself, cash flow went up, you know, because the market was demanding more financial education. It's always going up and down, in and out. And that's what investing is. You have the capital gains, cash flow, boom, bust, liquidity, all this stuff. And that's what financial education is. It's not this poor guy who says, I have a 401k and I was told to sell all my stocks and get into the bond market. Now, George, would you explain why you said that is the most stupid thing you could do? Because you're getting a future stream of dollars. That's all a bond is. You're buying a bond for a thousand dollars and they're saying, okay, in 10 years, we're gonna give you a thousand dollars back. And along the way, we'll pay you a little bit of interest. I mean. It's negligible at best. So what happens if we have a high rate of inflation because of the money printing, you're gonna get paid that thousand dollars back, but it's gonna buy you a loaf of bread. So you don't get back your purchasing power. You only get back your dollars. See, when I look at the stuff, I look at the relationship between equities or stocks and bonds. And so the reason the stock market went up is they kept dropping the interest rates on the bonds. So, you know, when I started off, Interest rates were about 16%. So if I had a bond, I was getting 16% interest. That was a very valuable bond. If they dropped the interest rate to 14%, my 16% bond was more valuable. That makes sure. sense. Like this, like my cash flow from the bond or the dividend was good. And so when the market kept crashing, they dropped it to eight. And today I think it's about two and a half on the long bond. So as to keep the stock market up, they had to keep dropping the bond price is down and now we're at zero. They call it the zero bound. Yeah. And that's where Japan is. Yeah, for a and long so time. They can't keep dropping that bond price. The stock market comes down. So that's the correlation between equities, stocks and bonds. So this is my question, George. So let's say today bonds are 2%. What happens if it goes to 5%? Because inflation comes in, they have to raise the bond rate to 5%. What happens to the two year bond? the value of the bonds purchased at 2% goes down. Yeah, and that's what that guy did. That's right, he's buying a bunch of stuff with a value. You really can't get any capital gain on it. The most likely you're gonna be stuck holding and that's not gonna be good in inflation. One of the great things about being an entrepreneur, going back to rich dad, poor dad, is you put yourself in the position of being a price maker where other people are price takers. The majority of people are price takers. So they have to take whatever price is offered by whatever it is they want to buy. But the real estate owner, the apartment owner, let's say, or the business owner can raise their prices if the rate of inflation is going up. So it hedges you against inflation while at the same time paying you to own it with that positive cash flow. And a bondholder does not have that opportunity to say the least. Bonds and stocks are liquid, real estate's not. So it's like that guy buying a bond at 2%. Nobody wants it if it's 5%. So if you buy a piece of real estate, let's say in Dallas, Texas, and suddenly the prices drop, it's hard to get out of that debt on that real estate because it's not liquid. Yeah. So the good thing about it, the bond, he can dump it and take his loss now, but real estate is illiquid. Yeah. And that's why we highly suggest 
investing in financial education because it's not an answer to it. It's a process. And my concern is, and I'm not saying don't buy, like I was just in Texas, it's a mania because everybody's running out of California and New York, wherever they're running from. And everybody wants to get out of the cities. So they want a piece of the country. So land prices spiked. Now, is that good or bad?